Welcome back, uh, everybody, to the second uh, to the second part of the of the workshop of, um, of today. That we will discuss uh, how to incorporate foresight into the orientation and definition of public policies. Uh, it will be our requirements, conditioning factors, and um, and challenges. Uh, but before we go into into the panel, I want to to say that uh, this activity today, uh, along with. Uh, uh, the support of uh, the United Catalonia uh, is part of um, of our um, a new um, a new area that is being developed in the, uh, at CIDOP, uh doing a foresight. We we started uh, last year uh, with a huge involvement in some European uh, projects and also with collaborations with uh, local governments and regional governments and national government. So uh, our aim is to incorporate and help the society and, and the authorities to, to bring the foresight into, into the practice. And uh, this is also part of what we are doing here um, today. So uh, the idea, I think, is to... Hi. hi. Um, regarding the, 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 pan the, the panel today, uh, it's about discussing institutional redesigns and the necessary procedures to ensure the effectiveness as well as spreading the requirements, condition and factors, and challenge involved. So it's about how do we incorporate foresight into uh, governmental uh, practices. So to that end, uh, we will start with um, an, an, a keynote speaker a, a speak from uh, Secretary General uh, Diego, Diego, Diego Rubio. Um, he's, there it is. Yes, the Secretary General of European Affairs, Public Policy and Strategic Foresight of the Presidency of the Government of Spain. Uh, the panel will work very similar to the previous one. It will be uh, around 30 minutes uh, speech uh, for Mr. Uh, Diego Rubio, follow up initial reaction from the rest of the speakers in the, at the table. Um, and then uh, each of the rest of the speakers will have some insights from their uh, experience and uh, practice of, uh, of foresight. So, um, Diego, thank you very much for being here today with us. Um, Please, the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to be here, surrounded by so many distinguished colleagues uh, and, and friends. Um, so, uh, as Victor just said, um, um, uh, Paul asked me to answer this very complicated question. How, what challenges do we face when we try to incorporate foresight into, into policy making? I, I fail to do so quite often, so I'm not sure I'm the right person to, to explain it, but uh, I, I, will, I will give you my, 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 my tricks. Um, but before that, let me provide you with a little bit of context so you know where my answers are, are coming from. Um, four, four years ago, in January 2020, at the beginning of the last political term, uh, we created um, in Spain uh, the first um, foresight unit of the government. Um, and um, this was created, uh, uh, this, it is based at the Prime Minister's office in Madrid. Um, and when we created it, I think most we were the smaller directorate of the seven or eight directorates that comp comprise uh, the presidency of Spain. Um, uh, and I think nobody knew what what we were and why we were there and, and what kind of job or work we will do. Uh, we, we, were, we were not sure either. But um, a, f a few weeks later, um, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, broke out. And uh, that small team was the first unit that produced uh, the first um, uh, economic, um, um, epidemiological, and social um, forecast of uh, the pandemic. Uh, several weeks, several months before uh, the Bank of Spain, uh, the main universities of the country, uh, way before international organizations and, and others. Not because we were smarter, but because we played with uh, something that the others didn't have, which is that we didn't have to publish our results. And this allowed us to be more blunt, uh, you know, and, and to take more risk. Um, and also we had more freedom to say things that you don't have when, you, when things go public. Um, so this was the first time that the president and the council of ministers, because we advised the two, uh, although we reported elected to, to the president, uh, had a, a picture um, of you know, the scale 
of the pandemic and the impacts that it could have. And I, I must say, and hope, I hope that one day we will be able to publish that, um, we got the numbers pretty, pretty well. Uh, not me, the team mainly of economies and, uh, that, we had, uh, that we have in the team. Um, and then people started to realize why this was useful. Um, a few weeks later, they asked us to produce the exit strategy. So um, at the very moment in which uh, we were announcing the lockdown, um, we started to work uh, in the exit strategy. People in the government were worried about what things we will close and how we were um, commissioned to think about how will we open those things when the moment was right, right? And we designed the strategy that was um, implemented uh, a few months later and that it was copied by other member states, I would say, and also uh, countries, particularly in Latin America. Um, Sorry, so this allows us to show um, already from the beginning the utility of, 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 of our job, of our work, uh, and we started to grow and we, we end up being the second largest unit uh, at the Prime Minister office. Um, we still exist, and uh, now uh, this unit uh, uh, is also um, collaborating with other units that we have created in this second political term uh, at the Department of, Politi of, 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 Politica, of Public Policy and others. Um, and so mainly what we do is um, we advise with policy notes uh, the president, sometimes some ministers, uh, and sometimes, uh, not very often, unfortunately, we publish uh, some reports some some studies for the general public. And uh, when we think that topic is broad enough, so we, we want to reach uh, the world society. So for instance, we produce... Um, a couple of years ago, something called Spain 2050, which was the first long-term national strategy ever produced in Spain. This is a 600 pages long document that was crafted by 100 scholars of, of all disciplines, all sorts of uh, political sensibilities that you know, try to understand what, is, what things are gonna or may happen or should happen in, in, in Spain in the next 30 years. Um, and uh, more recently, we produced, uh, in collaboration with the Commission, uh, something called Resilient EU 2030. Um, this is a, a, an analysis of the strategic vulnerabilities that Europe uh, may face uh, by the end of this decade, and how do we tackle those uh, in this global context. And that document was produced with more than uh, 200 experts from 70 different ministries, 7-0, uh, from the 27 member states. And it was a technical document that was used and approved to craft the uh, so-called Granada Declaration, which is, uh, which is this document that was signed by the Council, European Council um, in Granada, and that uh, alongside with uh, the Versailles Declaration uh, are the two uh, main pillars to design uh, what we are now crafting uh, in Brussels, uh, uh, which is the strategic agenda of the EU, which is this document that shows uh, where are we headed or where should we head it uh, in, the, in the next five years. So this is in a nutshell the, the, the work we do. We are a team of, uh, of uh, um, scholars, most of them with PhDs in uh, political science, uh, economy, uh, sociology, um, uh, engineering and, uh, and environmental studies. This is more or less the team. Um, and, uh, and let me let me try to address a question on, on you know what are the main challenges that we face when we try to incorporate um, foresight into policy making. Uh, three main uh, challenges came uh, come to mind. The first one is uh, methodological, which is um, you know how do we marry um, foresight with the need of making um, evidence-based policy making. Um, and this is a huge challenge. It may sound, you know, most people or people often assume that these two, these two things go hand in hand. And actually in some governments, they fall within the same uh, unit. So for instance, in the UK government, uh, foresight is uh, one branch of the two branches of the uh, science office that is part of, of the prime minister office as well. Um, and, and this happens in many other places. But the truth is that, and, and very often in reports, and also we, we assume that foresight is part of this evidence-based policy making, but it's rather the opposite in most cases, in my opinion. Foresight, as you know, is a very old discipline, very old, I mean, mid 20th century. Um, it has evolved a lot ever since. It has 
uh, very important uh, uh, people conducting it. But the truth is that that evolution has taken place very far away from academia. Uh, and that brings, that poses uh, uh, huge problems in my opinion, because um, in my opinion, and I know that I'm gonna be controversial, but it's okay. Um, the methods that most foresighters use um, are good to you know, run um, design thinking exercise to keep interested uh, the board of a company for a few hours, but they are not suited to produce policy making, particularly nowadays with the technical requirements that are there, not only uh, posed by governments themselves, but also as well by the European Commission. So it's time you're crafting a policy, you're justifying that you're gonna do something in one particular way, you have to, you have to explain it why. And, uh, and uh, this requires uh, using methods that usually are very far away from, from the methods that uh, foresighters are, are using. So what we do um, is uh, we don't consider, consider ourselves uh, foresighters, we consider ourselves academics that are using those methods that we find in our academic disciplines that allow us to anticipate and um, potential project trends, anticipate potential scenarios, and so on and so forth. So the, the end product is the same, but the, the, the method that we are using, I think, is uh, sometimes uh, very different. Um, which is also a challenge, because as you know, um, academic knowledge is mainly retrospective, not prospective. Um, when I was doing the PhD, uh, Professor told me, um, somebody gets a PhD, by talking about the past, maybe studied in the present, but never studied in the future. And that's true, it's, this is how it really works. Um, fortunately, things are changing now, they've been changing, I would say, over the past 10 years, mainly because environmental studies. I think that you know, scientists have really um, changed that uh, uh, tradition, they have really started to produce, already in the late 80s and 90s, but what has become mainstream nowadays, you, you get very solid academic disciplines that are producing models on how things are gonna look like or could look like in 10, 20 years, 30 years from now. And this is opening an opportunity for social scientists to do the same in a more qualitative, uh, in a more quantitative way. Um, so we try to use those, um, uh, those, meso those methods. Does it mean that we never do anything qualitative? No, of course, uh, because, uh, but what it means is that we, try to use quantitative methods and exercise as the, as the, as the backbones of our analysis and projections and ex scenario building exercises and so on. It's always have a quantitative uh, uh, foundation. Uh, I can get into more details uh, later if you want. Um, the second challenge um, we face uh, is uh, one of, 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 of time uh, because the question is, how do you make um, the most, the busiest guy in the country uh, to take time not only to think about the problems that he has in his table, which is a huge pile, uh, but also in problems that may or may not uh, come to be uh, in five, 10, 20, 40, 50 years from now, right? Um, so in theory, it sounds like we should be worried in, and we keep saying this in, in speeches all the time, uh, we should worry not only about the origin, but also about the important, blah, 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 and, and um, we all agree with that. But the, the, the reality in a government, on, in the day-to-day -day business, is that you don't have time, you barely have time to sleep. Uh, imagine to start considering, you know, problems about the crisis of sand that may happen, you know, in 50 years from now. And there's a lot of academic evidence that may happen, but still, you know, it's 50 years away from, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's complicated. So how, how, do you, how do you make that person, you know, decision makers, uh, to worry about things that may happen in the future, in the distant future? Well, in our case, we don't, we don't even try to do that. Uh, that's not our approach. I know that that's the dominant one, so I know that many foresight um, institutions, even within governments, uh, consider that their main contribution is agenda setting, that their main role is to look into the future and to try to con 
find new topics that should be studied and to bring the, the attention of decision makers on those topics. I, I know and I think it's great, it's necessary, we feed into that, uh, from that uh, work all the time, but this is not what we do. Um, uh, what we do is, uh, we, we, we use a different approach. Um, instead of bringing new decisions to the table, what we do is try to um, make the president um, understand the long-term implications of the decisions that he has to make today. Um, so it's time there's a decision that has to be made um, because it's urgent. Uh, we come and said, okay, you're, con you're going to be considering a number of issues, a number of factors, political factors, economic factors, blah, 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 but all of them have something in common. They are short-sighted. And this is something that we've seen working with ministries for five years now. Um, you know, it's time the president has to make a decision. There is a pile of documents in his table. It's, it's, of, it's one of them coming from a different ministry that wants him to understand, to see the problem from their perspective. And uh, they are completely different from each other, but they have one thing in common. They're short-sighted. They're thinking, you know, in the next year or in the next year. So we bring the... 10 years, 20 years, 30 years uh, perspective. Um, meaning how that thing is going to evolve, how that thing ma may resonate in all the ch structural changes that we feel may be happening, so on and so forth, right? Um, so let me, for instance, give you a very specific example. During the, uh, in, in 2022, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, you know that among other things that trigger uh, an, inflation, uh, an inflationary crisis because all the uh, agricultural products that we were bringing from Russia and Ukraine, which were huge, particularly from Ukraine, stopped uh, coming to, to Europe. And that trigger, you know, it was one of the main drivers of, 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 the, of the price of food uh, going up uh, during those, during those uh, two years. Um, and that triggered also a, a huge conversation in Europe about our supply chains uh, and the vulnerabilities we have. And uh, people started thinking, saying, we, have to, we need to find solutions for this. Also, at a national level, we had that conversation. Um, so, for instance, one of the main um, worries was um, plant proteins. You, if, you may, if you remember, in the 90s, we had something called uh, the crazy cows um, uh, disease. After that, in Europe, you, can, you cannot use animal protein to feed livestock. It's, 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 for, it's forbidden. So you have to use plant protein. We mainly bring, produce that plant protein out of uh, soybeans uh, that we don't grow in Europe. We m mostly bring that from uh, Brazil and, and the US. Uh, so all the sudden there was the worry, you know, what would happen if this uh, supply chain stopped, particularly coming from the US because of Trump, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and then a lot of people started to say, well, we need to start growing soybeans uh, in Spain. And this is where we can do it, and this is a way of doing it, blah, blah, blah. We already tried that in the past, actually. One of the most common things we do before looking into the future is looking into the past, and uh, we already tried that, and it didn't work well at all uh, for a number of reasons. So this was the first thing we said. But the second thing we said after talking with many experts, and this is something that we do all the time because the team is, 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 is fairly big, but it's, it's, it's not that big to, uh, to have all the knowledge in it. So. Uh, over the past, over the, of, over the past, these four years, we've collaborated with more or less 600 experts. We we keep a, an Excel, uh, 600 experts from all sorts of disciplines, and um, what we realized that instead of planting soya beans in, in Europe or in Spain, which wasn't possible for a number of reasons, we should start investing in algae and insects, because there is already a technology to produce protein to feed cattle out of algae and, and, and insects. And particularly algae are some, is a very interesting option for Spain because we have a lot of cost that we, we don't use. You don't need fresh water to, to grow this, that while you, when you need uh, fresh water to grow uh, soybeans and so on. So to keep it story, uh, long story short, what we did was, okay, to the agricultural ministry, to the industry ministry, to others. Okay, let's start thinking in solving this problem, this vulnerability, but using a solution of the future, not a solution of the past, because uh, you know um, this technology is there, uh, and this was done. Um, so obviously, this forces us to 
keep an eye in the present all the time, and that's the annoying thing. So I think one of the beautiful things of Foresight is that you can, you know, just be reading and thinking about new stuff and, and not you don't have to read the press every day. Uh, we have to, which is a pain in the ass, but uh, it's the only way that we really can connect the what is happening today. Um, and this has allowed us um, to become not a think tank within government, which is a model that many governments have, and, and obviously we respect that a lot. Uh, Canada and others have it, and, 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 and it's great. Uh, this gives you a lot of independence, uh, because you know you're there in a different building, 30 guys doing their their stuff, and they produce PDFs, and that's it. And they have no influence; they get no pressure from government or from nobody else. The problem is that those PDFs are mostly ignored, and they they themselves acknowledge that. Uh, so we have the different thing. We are embedded in the decision-making process so much so that I sit at the steering committee of the presidency, which is the the committee that on a weekly basis you know, helps the presidents to make decisions and into other meetings. So you, we are really part of the, the mechanism. Um, now, I know that I'm running uh, out of time, but let me share with you just one last um, challenge briefly that I think we face and that um, is interestingly enough for me, we don't, I, I barely see a conversation about that um, in the, you know, in the, in, in the academia, which are which is the the ethical uh, the ethical dilemma, because if you think about it, our societies are are uh, foresight and forecasting machines. We are, you know, producing outlooks, quantitative or qualitative, about the future constantly, all the time. We are saying, you know, how the inflation is going to be, how you know GDP growth is going to be, uh, weather, um, the war, uh, you name it, anything, transport, anything. We are constantly, you know, the, the price, as you know, the price you pay in your, uh, for your electricity is not based on any, anything real. It's based on the future markets. It's based on foresight and forecasting. So, you know, it's, it's, we are doing that all the time. And we are making decisions. Our governments, our central banks, our companies are making very important decisions uh, that affect our lives every day based on those projections and outlooks. But the truth is that the methodology of those outlooks is extremely flooded. And this is not a criticism to, 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 to those methods because future doesn't exist, cannot be studied in a scientific way. Uh, it requires a different approach. Uh, um, but, you know, it's, uh, so you understand, it's not a criticism to, to the methods, uh, it's just, I'm just acknowledging that they are extremely flooded. I'm not, I'm not talking about very weird foresight exercises only, I'm talking about IMF projections on inflation. Uh, we've checked them, you know, they, they fail uh, quite often um, by two, three points, which is a lot, you know, in inflation, two or three points of failure is huge. It's the difference between being in a crisis and not being in a crisis. Uh, zero percent inflation is problematic, two percent inf inflation is, is great, four percent inflation, you're fucked. So, you know, it, this, this kind of, uh, you know, the method is, is not solid enough and yet we are making decisions all the time. I understand that we need it because we cannot leave with the anxiety of not knowing what is going to happen, and we need to plan anyways. So because we need to plan, it's better to have something, right? But um, I think that something that has changed, uh, uh, something that they've discovered or that has been new to me uh, when uh, being in doing this in government and not in academia as, as I used to do it before, is that you really feel the weight of responsibility you know, of the decisions you are making. And then you realize that sometimes, you know, these decisions are huge decisions, are going to change the life of millions, and you really are just guessing. It's the best guess you have, and I know, I understand. But I think we should have a more collective conversation about this um, to, um, to see, you know, what check and balances or what methods can we use to, to improve or uh, to, to protect ourselves, uh, uh, or at least to, you know, to have a a code on how do we uh, address these, these things. But anyway, I, I, I've talked too much already, so I'm, I'm gonna shut up now, and, uh, and then if there's all these issues, we can discuss it in, in the questions. Thank you. Thank you.
very much, uh, Diego, for for your for your talk, to your explanation, and, and be so so frank uh, discussing the the challenges and the daily practice of the of the, of the ministry, um, of the presidency of the of the president. Uh, so I will I would like to, so the rest of the panelists to to have some comments, a chance, uh, something that is surprising for you. But before that, let me very briefly introduce uh, them. Uh, we have with us uh, Flynn uh, Wanke, if I say it correctly. <laughs> that is, uh, <laughs> she's the team leader for site for policy and administration competence center for site at uh, Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation, is she? Um, she, she will discuss it later. She has uh, embedded in the institutionalization of a strategic foresight within the Germ uh, German federal government. So she will uh, talk a little bit about how to do that, how to put a strategic foresight in the, um, in the chancellery or in a, in a, into, into a, a government. Um, on, the, uh, on, on the far left, <laughs> we have um, Grigo Drott. Uh, Drost? Oh, uh, Drost. Drost. Yeah, that's yeah. a challenge in this panel. Eh? Um, <laughs> Deputy Head of Unit for Foresight and Strategic Communication. Uh, he is the, um, in the political action plan. Before we have here Anne Brock, that he was on the ERC. Here he's the correspondent at the European Commission, so translating the foresight exercises into political action. And um, finally, um, uh, we have uh, Henin, uh, Henin Rick, yes, Director of Strategic Foresight at the um, Bundesk Academy, and uh, he will focus on the importance of education and cultural uh, challenge within the organization in order to success in these uh, foresight practices. So uh, please, first reaction, comment, something you'd like to highlight, Henin. Okay, thank you very much, um, Diego, for that interesting talk, and it uh, foreshadows, I think, a lot of what we will talk about in this in this session here. First, uh, I like the idea how you are able to um, spread the news about foresight with success, uh, stories of success, that you could actually um, spur uh, political reactions and enable governments to do something because they had uh, received news about foresight, and I think this is a this is very important because um, uh, sometimes people go, come to you and ask you, or oh, my new boss in the, in the Federal Academy, he said, okay, uh, give me an example of uh, how you predicted something perfectly well. <laughs> and uh, it took a, lot of a bit of explaining, but he, but he came across that uh, foresight is, of course, not foretelling the future. And if somebody comes up with symbols of crystal balls and so, it's, um, uh, it's always like a, uh, off the mark because it's opening the, the, the space of, 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 of expectations. It's the ability to think about multiple futures in the same time. And um, I think to, to give an example how that has worked for, for, for government policy is great. And um, I think you can also, uh, and, and you made that point, um, integrate foresight into the toolbox of um, uh, future instruments, so to speak because it, it, it is uh, possible that uh, the quantitative and the qualitative methods are mutually inspiring. The people who do predictions, um, normally um, they, they think they have the right tools because it's evidence-based and they, they ex extend um, the trends that they see now, but they need, of course, to adapt um, their choice of factors that they're looking at. And um, uh, for, for that, a bit of foresight and openness to the future is absolutely necessary. And the other way around, if you do um, scenario work, uh, it's quite good to incorporate existing uh, forecasts that have been made. But usually, um, uh, the, the, the hardcore quantitative guys, they come to the foresight and say, ah, come on, you're, everything you do is just imagination and that's science fiction and it doesn't really count. Um, but um, I think you can tell them then first that, um, of course, the future is always imagination. Even if you think about whether your metro will come in five minutes or not, the future is always um, imagination because in the moment when it becomes truth, it's, uh, it's presence. It's no longer the future. Um, so you imagine all the while, and so it's fair to, to do this in a controlled way as the foresight is do. And, uh, and secondly, um, when the predictors say that they can actually um, support planning that goes five, 10, 20 years, I mean, I work in the, in the defense field. How much, um, how much time does, uh, does an arms project take? 
then um, I think they have uh, uh, they are the ones who who are lunatics and, um, uh, and have too much imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Hen. Flim, uh, Flim. Yeah. Thank you, Diego, for your fascinating talk. I <laughs> I could have questions for hours. I think. I hope there's time to discuss. But I want to comment on one thing you noticed, noted in passing in the beginning when you said, luckily, your work was not published. If I got it right on COVID. And I think this is a very important issue you raised here. Uh, from my short experience in the German chancellery, that uh, it's all very important for foresight to go out and participatory exercise to talk with experts and stakeholders, but it's also at least as important to create confidential spaces within government where they can reflect on things that are uncertain, like you said, at, uh, implications of decisions. And so this is surprisingly rare in government. It does not exist. In the day-to-day -day work, they have to uh, make decisions and they are in their boxes and to create these spaces where they can trust that they can say, I don't know. I don't know. And to discuss these things is extremely important. So um, I, I would also uh, be interested in your how you see your work now, whether you still have the part that is confidential and uh, uh, having these discussions within government. And the second brief point, a very interesting um, uh, discussion on, on the academic uh, foundations of foresight. You said we you work with your academic uh, team and we are also seeing ourselves as researchers, as scientists. And I couldn't agree more that it's very important to involve all these different academic disciplines that have their way about quantitatively engaging with the future. But I really would like to argue that also the foresight itself has its academic foundations. For example, understanding human cognition, mm -hmm. understanding biases and perceptions, understanding why we are always make linear extrapolation and how you can challenge mental models, that is also a scientific discipline, and then organizational uh, studies to understand why organizations uh, work in a certain logic, why they are not recognizing the future. This is also an academic discipline. So um, there's also some science at the core <laughs> of foresight. Thank you, Philin. Uh, yeah, uh, many thanks. Uh, great to be uh, with you, Diego, in the same session. And not just because you're a very uh, good guy, but also because you really helped us a lot to push foresight at the EU level with the work that you did in our network. So um, that's, that's uh, hugely appreciated and uh, helps us to build even stronger case for foresight in the next commission. I think that's, uh, that's very relevant. Um, two things. Uh, one, building on what Filin said about uh, uh, public and informal foresight. I fully agree that sometimes we cannot go to the public with, with, with some things that need to stay confidential, especially if you want to be very honest in, in some assessments. You know, if you would take scenarios for Ukraine, publicly admitting that maybe Ukraine might lose the, the war, or if you start talking about I don't know, the, the green objectives, what happens if, if the EU abandons green objectives, or I don't know, US elections, so things like this, <laughs> that are extremely relevant and very timely, but also very sensitive. Uh, so it might not always be able to, to you know, be fully transparent about it, but at the same time, to do a very good product on it, you need to involve as many people, experts, and, and things like this um, into it to, to, to make sure that at the end of the day what, what comes out uh, makes sense in a way. So there's a bit of tension here, even if you want to create safe space and, 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 and good um, uh, environment for, for this, uh, it might be simply difficult or impossible to, to, to combine the, the two aspects. And second, I wanted to share my frustration about quantitative versus foresight as well. anna Catherine was telling you about our experience with better regulation, so we have this great tool that helps us to do better impact assessments, which is nice in principle. Uh, but uh, then once you uh, you know, we have this draft impact assessment and you have all those uh, nice indicators, uh, quantitative things that are nice. And then you start mentioning like, oh, there are like different scenarios and maybe there are different options. And then colleagues reading it like, 
you know, the first reaction is like, what are you even talking about? So they always have the, uh, the, the tendency to take out those elements which are more difficult to, to explain or that are a bit speculative, but still important. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's a challenge we fully share in a way and, and, and something that we need to look into um, in the next years to make sure that the tool that we put forward, that's not obligatory, but it's, it's there, it's actually used at the end of the day because it would not be the case if colleagues that invest in using foresight for impact assessments will see that actually it doesn't pay off or actually might get punished for doing some extra work because then it's not taken on board. Thanks. Thank you, Grigor. Uh, Grigor. And uh, before uh, giving the floor to, to Flynn, let me, let me share, because I also have the, the reflection, the same as Flynn, that uh, with this sentence, no, if results are not published, you may be more blunt. And it came to my mind some of the practices that is also done in the private sector, for instance, uh, in the banks, they had a regulatory change after 2008, and then the ECB says, okay, you need to do uh, forecasting, you have to have these scenarios, uh, central scenario, upside, downside, and uh, there are a lot of research behind that. Uh, you have some degree uh, to, to do that, and uh, I have been in several institutions, and uh, you have these two things, that if it's not published, you may be more bland, and you are in bed in the, in the decision-making process, so this is very valuable. Uh, also, I think sometimes there's a risk that if it's not published, as it's an inside organization, uh, it has the, the risk of, of, um, of being captured, of being too complacent to, to your bosses. No? So yeah. um, I think you, you have these two things that are very important forces. Uh, if they work or you have a standard regulation that you may challenge inside, then no? um, you can be blunt enough, but at the same time, uh, answer your, your process. So yeah. there, there's some... some uh, you, you're totally right. I, I agree with all, all the comments. And, and, and actually, another challenge is that when you don't share those scenarios with the general public, it makes, it makes it harder to explain why decisions are made in a certain way. Uh, because you're not giving the people the whole, the whole process, the whole change of thought that reached that, that, that conclusion. But let me say just a couple of brief things, uh, building off what you've said, uh, that I completely agree with them. Um, confidential spaces are, are essential. Uh, you know, I remember, so, so when after we produced the first scenarios and we started to see others being published and forecasts and the scenarios on the pandemic and and, we, and they were like extremely optimistic, all of them, at the beginning. And we were like, what, what are we missing? Are we, you know? So we started to call these institutions to you know, uh, understand what was there. And I remember having a conversation with a very important institution that we were like, OK, but what if we don't develop a vaccine? And they were like, yeah, we, don't, we are not considering that scenario. Uh, so all this that you're seeing is assuming that it will take us between this and these months to produce the vaccine and blah, blah. Okay, but what if we don't have a vaccine? You know, we have viruses that we don't have vaccines for. Uh, this is this is this w wouldn't be a surprise. So we have already forgot this this possible scenario. But w because w and I understand that for those institutions saying to the public, look, this may be here for the next ten years it was unacceptable, they couldn't do it. it. It would cost, because if you're a central bank, for instance, you have a lot of responsibilities in keeping the economy uh, together, not only about informing the people. Uh, but when you don't have to you know, deal with the public, you can be more, more, more free. And, and I agree also what you've said, um, the, two, the two of you tapped on, on this. Um, I think for me, foresight is uh, the discipline that helps forces but helps people to think about the future and, and to, it, to do it in a more efficient way. And one of the best ways that foresight can help uh, people doing that is precisely being aware. So the future is, as um, uh, Aquinas already said you know, several centuries ago, the future is an expectation. And um, that, how that expectation is built in our mind and in our cultures can be a study. You know, the future cannot be studied in a scientific way because it doesn't exist. But how do we produce those expectations can be studied in a very scientific way. And we can understand. And now we have a lot of knowledge about the biases, not only individual, but also at a social, a social level that operates uh, and all the influence and interest. And so we can help 
you know, and uh, sometimes it's very necessary because um, sometimes one of our main job is to say the boss, because sometimes, you know, an institution on, or somebody says, you know, this is what is going to happen. This is IMF, to go back to the same example, IMF says inflation won't be a problem next year. So everybody is like, wow, finally, you know, we're going to start thinking in other stuff. And, like, and our job is to say no, because IMF gets it wrong. So, you know, our plan cannot be assuming that this time is going to be right for sure. Even if we have an optimist bias and we want to believe that they are right. Uh, so let's start considering other options. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally agree. So, thank you, um, Diego. Uh, Filin, I would like you, I, I will give the floor to you, but please uh, have in mind you have 15 minutes, and yeah. if it's 10, better than 15. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah. you. Can you open the presentation? Yes. Oh. Philippe, do you want to jump here to, uh, or no, you I have a clicker? See. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. But you're going to yeah. need this, right? Yeah, I need this. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm very happy to be here in this uh, exciting panel. And as uh, Victor already mentioned, I'm going to talk about institutionalizing force in, in government, which is an important aspect in this difficult marriage we talked about in the last session. Oops. Uh, how is this? Uh, maybe a different button. Yes, no, yes. I see. Ah, okay, sorry, yeah, okay. I will say one word about our competence center because that also gives you a bit of con context and then my main focus will be about institutionalizing foresight in government. Why should we bother? I know that the last session was about why you're doing foresight, but why thinking about institutionalization? Uh, there will be two slides on this. And then maybe why worry? So what are the problems if we want to make foresight, uh, to integrate foresight or embed foresight in the day-to-day -day government work? So our competence center, and that fits very nicely what actually with what Diego was saying. We are a research institute. We are 300 staff, uh, Fraunhofer ISI, Fraunhofer Institute of Systems and Innovation Research. And we do, in a nutshell, we are looking at uh, innovation systems, innovation processes, and system transformations. And we are doing this in very different areas, in energy, mobility, health, ICT. We have all these different departments. And uh, our foresight group, uh, actually, we should be in the middle and not in the, co in the uh, corner there, because we are like, like a spider. We are the smallest group. We are 15 researchers. And whenever there is some topic to explore, we collaborate, like you and your team, with the energy people, for example. We do a lot of energy transformation, foresight work. We, we really bring in the quantitative models from the energy people or the, from the mobility people or the health people. So we work uh, exactly in this way, but of course in a research institute and not in a government context. But uh, we also do a lot of policy advice, so many of the issues you mentioned are familiar to us when we um, discuss our findings with policymakers. So institutionalizing foresight in government, why bother? So this is what, uh, what is the issue at stake. So on the left side, uh, well, left and right is also <laughs> a question of perspective here. You see a complex system, or well, that's the best representation I found of a complex system. And actually, all the systems that we look at in reality are complex systems, not in the sense that they are complicated, they are also complicated, but complex in the sense that things move in nonlinear, unexpected ways. So, like this plane, it can change very sudden into a different attractor of the system. The ball, we had these balls here. <laughs> and, um, so I was quite fascinated because I also have them here. So they can spring up. And especially if humans are involved, and all our interesting systems are about human systems, because we have feedback loops. We, we anticipate what we do and what others will think. So the whole system is evolving in non-linear ways, and this is why I think all the speakers emphasized here that the future cannot be 
uh, predicted. So it's really about recognizing complexity. And foresight is a great tool to, to help our mental models, which are not suited to deal with such complex system, to, uh, to do better justice to this non-linearity, to this uh, non, not, uh, it cannot be modeled, um, yeah, to this uncertainty. And, but what we have to do if we uh, want to help governments to do forward-looking anticipatory is to bring this thinking about complex systems into these structures. And this is one German ministry, structure of one German ministry uh, on the other side. And we have, I think, Henning, 14, 15 of these uh, ministries. So we, we have many more. <laughs> Okay, so institutionalization is all about bringing this uh, complex system into these boxes. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why bother. <laughs> yeah. I understand that many of you are ac actually from public sector and have experience in administration, so uh, I, I suppose this probably resonates also with your daily experience, even so not in all countries is as... Uh, extensive as in Germany. So institutionalization uh, is a for short academic definition process by which certain obligations and ideas are given a rule-like status in social considerations and actions. There was a lot of discussion about actions, actual actions, but um, in order to transfer foresight into actions, you have to have this process from the foresight thinking into the actual actions that happen in, within these boxes. And this is a long road. So uh, why worry <laughs> about this transfer? And now I'm going to re, um, tell a bit about the results, about a recent study we did. We, had, uh, um, we were privileged to be commissioned by the German Chancellery to do this study. Maybe I just uh, switch to the next slide, um, to, with the aim to develop practical options for institutionalizing strategic foresight in the federal government. The situation was that for a long time already, I think from 2013, there was a commitment in the coalition treaty in Germany to do foresight in the government. So there is already foresight a lot in the individual ministries, but to do foresight on government level. And actually very little happened, apart from that the training that Henning here is doing was uh, intensified, which is a very important step, actually. But uh, so then activities started a little, and they realized that they really don't know how to go about it. So that's why they commissioned this study. And the reason why I put this boring slide here <laughs> is that I wanted to emphasize the research team because we foresighters, we know all about uh, building scenarios, doing fu uh, horizon scanning, future search, all the methods, road mapping. But in order to, uh, to help government really to think forward looking, you also have to have, and this is another academic uh, foundation of foresight, you have to have solid understanding of how administrations actually work, how, admit, ad, uh, how decisions come about. Otherwise, like somebody here said, you're always handing re reports and you are frustrated why there is no action, but there is no surprise because you're not going through this arrow. And this is why we teamed up with uh, Sylvia Feit, who is professor of administrative science and public management, and actually that was extremely useful. And I think the most important findings of our study are actually from, from her. So this is one of my main conclusions, if we talk about here uh, requirements, is to team up with people who actually understand administration and policy making instead of only relying on foresight methods. So I think I will probably skip that one, given my 15 minutes. So again, coming to that, that was a bit the methodology of our study, but we can discuss this in the lunch break if, if you are interested. So what are the researchers on administration telling us about institutionalization? They emphasize three key mechanisms. How does it happen that certain obligations and ideas are given a role rule-like status. You have reg can have regulatory institutions that generate actions because you have to do it in government. For example, we have a kind of sustainability 
assessment in Germany that is mandatory. I don't know if you have similar things, like for every law, some impact assessments and uh, sustainability assessments. That's this regulatory institutionalization. Then you have normative institutions. This is just because it's the way we do things here. This is our values. You mentioned ethics. It's, it's our obligation to reflect on what if this is not successful. So this is normative institutions. And then you have cognitive institutions. That is the way we perceive the reality, the way we look at these uh, complex systems. And so that means if we talk about institutionalization, we need to consider these three pillars. And uh, translate it, oops, it's maybe not so very readable, into um, concrete research questions. So you have the organizational dimension, and that is actually the first thought we had, that it's all about advising the chancellery where to put the unit. As you said, where should it be? Should it be in the prime minister's office, or should it be in the ministry? But this is the organizational dimension. It's also important. But the regulatory dimension and the normative dimension, and even more importantly, the cultural cognitive dimension, is as important if you want to have successful institutionalization. So that was the first thing we learned from Sylvia when we started the study. And then there are some well-known um, um, insights in administrative studies, probably for you, it's like bringing olds to Athens because you are from this field of research, I would say, but for us foresighters, it's, uh, it, it was really a learning process that even from the 70s or even in the 50s already, there were studies saying that it's very difficult to have this kind of holistic thinking in government. Negative coordination this is a, a, a very a key term in public administration studies. So decisions are prepared as far as possible in the responsible unit. And I worked for one year at the chancellery, and I really can say that's true. Only if they really have to, a unit goes to another unit to say, let's coordinate. So for as long as possible, they keep it within their realm, because then it gets uncertain, and maybe other actors have other, are from other parties or whatever. So only very late others are involved. Then you have selective perception. That sounds very fancy, but it really means that if one of these many units in the boxes looks at reality, they look at their little part of it, and they have to do it. They have to reduce complexity in order to cope with day-to-day -day work. But that is, of course, very contradictory to the holistic complex system we looked at in the beginning. And the opposite, positive coordination, that very early before something even starts, you, co you cooperate between different players, this is actually extremely rare, and also for good reasons. As already in the 70s, there was a lot of optimism. I don't know about Spain. I know that in France there was the same movement, like everything can be predicted, and we uh, long-term um, planning. That's actually when the chancellery was created and there was a lot of optimism. But already then researchers realized that this is uh, uh, very limited. So we should really read the old <laughs> literature which is telling us why we sometimes fail in our foresight. So this is now a bit away from the theory. Uh, but still on the barriers between the one side and the other side. This is when we asked, uh, because our study was commissioned by the chancellery, we were lucky that we could interview really high-level people in the government from all the ministries, even Secretary of State. And we asked them about the barriers for forward-looking policy. And if you look at this, and this is not that we had a list and asked them, is this a barrier, but we asked openly, and uh, we, then we assessed what they came up with spontaneously. And the bureaucratic structures were really on the top of the list. So it's not about we don't know the methods. Uh, even time pressure is also, has also been mentioned a lot, but it's mainly the way the daily policy work is structured is not in line with how the foresight thinking goes. This is very on the top of the list. As a working on thinking culture, the, um, things, policy mode of getting things, things done, fixation on the present, many said fixation on the next day news. 
uh, what about the press is saying. So that's, that's contrary to the long-term view we need to take in foresight. Um, and then another result, um, we identified three tensions. One is formalization versus openness. For foresight, we need to be open to crazy ideas also. And um, somebody said foresight should be the, like the court jester, like the one at the king's court who always makes jokes and provokes people so, um, to think in different ways. But others said it should, be very, it should be formalized that we have an obligation to do foresight because otherwise we will not be allowed to spend the time. So there you have a clear tension between these two requirements. Then, and sometimes in the same interview, people would say both. So it should be formalized and it should be uh, open, it should be provocative, it should be creative. And then central coordination, on the one hand, it was always said it should be coordinated, it should be from the highest chancellery level, and, but of course, all the ministries said, but we have our autonomy. They shouldn't meddle with our strategies. And uh, thirdly, high level versus operational level involvement. It was always said there should be, from the very high level, there should be this value, this, this is how things are done. But then it was also said, if the people are not involved that are actually enacting these policies, the people, the operational people, nothing will happen. It will only be nice reports at the top level. So everybody also agreed that cultural change is key, but it will not come automatically. It will not come with the young generation. Some people say, ah, the young people, they are different. They are no longer think in boxes. But our interview partners said, if they are here for half a year, they have already adopted <laughs> <laughs> the box thinking. So our conclusion was that this is impossible to resolve within ex existing structures. And so our conclusions, and my question mark is whether this is for Germany uh, only, but we also had an international part of our study and we talked to people for, unfortunately, we tried to reach you, we didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think you were... Uh, you were very involved in the uh, Espana 2050 at the time, so we didn't, um, even the chancellery didn't manage. Uh, it was interesting. So, uh, but for example, Finland and uh, other countries we talked to, we saw similar issues. And from my experience from the Commission, to be honest, I, I know that uh, there are also similar mechanisms involved. You have many boxes, let's say. So um, it should be like this. Uh, and um, forward-looking government requires a protected foresight space that operates outside of the existing structures but is strongly linked into the system. And I, I was now, when you said um, we shouldn't be a think tank outside, I was saying, hmm, is this the opposite from what I was tr I'm trying to say, but I don't think so. Because, for example, uh, we said it shouldn't be a think tank, an independent think tank, but uh, it should, for example, have a regular slot in the cabinet, uh, or e even in the when the cabinet sometimes goes to discuss uh, confidential things. So it should be strongly linked, but it sh also should have links into all these boxes. So they should um, send people. The, all the ministries should regularly send people to work in this future slot. Yeah. So that I want to finish here because I think my 15 minutes are up, but um, you can download. Unfortunately, it's only available in German, um, but there are some summaries in English also. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So uh, before we go to the future, let's go a bit, a bit to the past. That's, that's a slide showing a bit the evolution of foresight in the Commission. First of all, just to tell you that foresight is not new in the Commission. We have a long and a rich and interesting um, uh, culture of foresight. It started with Jacques Delors uh, back still at the end of the 90s. He brought it from the French administration, the idea of perspective strategique, mm. and then it had uh, some ups and downs. But uh, what's really interesting is what happened in 2019. Uh, that's, um, and that's the year where President von der Leyen for the very first time nominated a dedicated person uh, in the college in charge of strategic foresight, so um, uh, now Executive uh, Vice President Maros Sefcovic. Um, and uh, that's, I would say, also when many things change in terms of our structures, approaches and processes, so that's, uh, that's an important year. Uh, for foresight and actually for strategic foresight as well because that's, I would say, um, a key approach that we have um, at the moment. Uh, for, for now, it ends at 2024 with the publication of a very recent report coming from the collaboration of all the EU institutions, so Global Trends Report, that um, sets some of the topics that we would see as key for the next mandate, so that's our input uh, into the next uh, political cycle. Uh, but uh, we are also at the moment of reflecting of what more we can do in the next commission, as you know, the, actually now in less than one month there are the elections uh, coming, so that's also a moment for internal reflection for us, for the administration to see how to approach things under the next mandate, so I would hope that this arrow goes even uh, somehow up uh, in the next mandate in terms of what we can do. All right, um, enough of uh, history, um, uh, a bit on the context. So if Pao would ask me why, um, why we have strategic foresight now in the Commission, say that back at the time the thinking was very much that the speed of change is increasing, that we have those complex interlinks between uh, different trends and the situation is more and more complex and more and more challenging for policymakers. So there was a need um, to try to have new tools at the disposal in the policy uh, toolbox to try to better address what's coming. Then uh, COVID happened, then the war happened, and we keep on seeing more and more of different type of crises, um, often called also poly crisis, so underlining the idea of, of links between them as well. So that only unfortunately helped us to strengthen the case for strategic foresight that we see very much at the EU level. We also see it in our collaboration with member states. So the case for sure is there. Um, and uh, kind of the key of, of, of this approach for strategic foresight is taking foresight as such and trying to apply it to actual uh, policy making um, and trying to see what it means for our policies, how can we better future-proof them and how we can better anticipate what's coming, both in terms of threats but also opportunities, I think underlining also the positive side of the story is uh, also important in terms of selling uh, strategic foresight to, um, uh, to policy makers. Uh, and actually something that I like very much about this approach is also the proactive thing, because that's often um, an interesting selling point. It's not that you can uh, just try to anticipate, prepare for different options, different futures, but you can also do something about it. And if you talk to the, uh, to the politicians, I think that's, that's also where they are interested because uh, you know, given the, the political cycles and things like this, what happens in 2040 might be a bit less relevant for them. But if you can tell them that now they can do something, um, uh, about it, that's, uh, that starts to be a different story. So, um, how we do it? First, the structures. It's uh, a bit of a boring part, or maybe actually listening to your presentation sometimes less boring, yeah, but a very uh, relevant uh, one actually, because without proper structures you will not get the results that you want. So, very first thing, and a crucial one for us, uh, having a dedicated person in the college, as you said, at every meeting is there and if necessary can bring some inputs. 
uh, that's, uh, that's extremely important for kind of sending the signal to the external world that this matters, that you have a sort of ambassador for your approach, but also for the internal stuff, because we have really somebody at the very top that can make sure that things happen. Uh, and for, um, uh, for the internal structures, that's, uh, that's very relevant. Something that is also very interesting in this context, that he's not only in charge of strategic foresight, but he also has the better regulation and the inter-institutional uh, parts of his portfolio. So that really boils down to very specific mechanisms that you have in the administration to make sure that things happen. So there is the political level of it. There is also the administrative level. Uh, we are both with anna katrin sort of gestures <laughs> at, uh, at, at the commission, and we are always a duo, a duo of science and, uh, and policy making coming from the Joint Research Center that has um, a lot of independence in terms of providing uh, scientific uh, analysis and doing foresight, and us being at the very center of policy making in the Secretariat General, where things are. Uh, coordinated, where you do policy planning, you're really at the heart of the whole machine of, of the commission, uh, is, uh, is very important. Uh, so our relation here is key, but there's also a lot of other departments that, that do their own more thematic foresight. You've heard uh, the story from uh, DGRTD, that's so important for horizon scanning, so making sure that we really invest in the future uh, technologies, but it happens in uh, agricultural context, it happens in external development, so there are more specific uh, things that are being developed as well. We have a lot of positive, I would hope, coordination as well, so we have the internal coordination between the departments, we have an internal network, the strategic foresight network, where all the departments from the Commission meet from time to time to, to see a bit what, what is happening and uh, just to know what others are doing, but sometimes maybe also develop some, some things together. We work with member states, that's a question that Henning asked, and we have uh, Diego that, um, uh, that uh, helped to shape this uh, collaboration a lot, so we have something called the EU-wide foresight network that was established by uh, Vice President Sefcovic as well, uh, with a, quite a simple idea that uh, there is a lot of strong players in Europe when it comes to foresight. There is a lot of those that are kind of new kids on the block or that are simply excited about it and would like to do something. So why not meet from time to time to um, exchange the best practice, try to see um, how we can help each other um, for those that have experience uh, share it with the others, for those that don't have it, ask how you can actually approach it in very practical terms. Um, and then we also saw that there is a lot of appetite to develop things together, so the, the project that Diego was leading was a very good example of also how to make sure that this cooperation can provide very important insights into the key political discussions happening in Europe. Um, and this also has a political level of ministers for the future, so each country actually has a designated minister uh, that uh, participates in, in the meeting on the political level from time to time. And then on top of it, we also collaborate between the EU institutions. Actually, at the moment, each institution, the parliament, the council, uh, the committee of the regions, uh, the economic social committee, uh, they all have their own uh, foresight cells, units, some people. Um, and so we also make sure that we uh, collaborate and exchange uh, practices uh, from time to time. And that's also um, uh, where the um, uh, global trends report are being produced. So first, structures. Second, products. Put here the, uh, uh, my, my favorite <laughs> one, so the strategic uh, foresight report. We did four of those that were mentioned. Um, before, uh, you see that there are mirrored, so we have the Science for Policy report where that is produced by colleagues in the Joint Research Center, where they can put on paper whatever, we wa whatever they want. And then we have the uh, political and policy version of it, so a communication that is adopted by the Commission, by the College, uh, and that is um, uh, the, the, the different political reading of the scientific report. What's important for it is that, um, okay, you might read it and sometimes you will find some things that are more interesting, sometimes less, 
but the process behind it is also very key because it really goes from a level of simple policy officer to the president and to the college throughout all the steps of the machine, making sure that everybody who participates in it also first, on one hand, learns something about foresight, on the other, um, kind of gets a similar understanding of, of what's, uh, what's coming. So it's uh, about structures, but also making sure that you have regular inputs coming uh, from, uh, from, from your site, sometimes uh, public, sometimes not, depending on, on what you need, but there is some regular input uh, to, to, to make sure that there is some momentum. Um, and then tools, uh, Anna Katrin mentioned most of them, so scenarios, megatrends hub, horizon scanning, visioning, this thing on better regulation. Sometimes it's about finding new things that, that, that we try to do. Sometimes it's more about building a uh, kind of looking at, at what's on the table, like the strategic foresight reports. We know what are the key priorities of the commission, so we're not trying to invent new ones, but we more want to see what's the relation between them, what are synergies, what are tensions. So it's, uh, trying to have quite a broad range of, of tools at your disposal serving very different uh, purposes. Uh, what's, I think it's always very important, especially if you want to build a case, is uh, be able to show impact of what you're doing. It's nice to have uh, um, reports, maybe somebody will read them, maybe not, but you also have to be sure that you're able at the end of the day to show that it matters and that you uh, are delivering uh, something. Uh, so it's not about just I know four, uh, four set reports, five horizon, horizon scanning reports and, and things like this, but being able to show that different type of insights, recommendations and, and, and things that were presented in those reports actually made a difference in terms of new initiatives, in terms of I know, changes in, in policy and, um, and uh, kind of policy outputs. And that is something that we do each year as well uh, internally. Uh, to make sure that on, for us we simply see whether some things work or not, but also to convince our bosses at the end of the day that it still makes sense to have a certain number of people working on it, it still makes sense to put some money behind it, because what you're doing uh, brings uh, concrete results. And my favorite one, people. Um, again, uh, foresight is always about people and making sure that you engage as many people as possible not only to try to get a good result at the end of the day, but also build ownership of what you're doing. If you produce something, maybe even like super interesting and you just put it on the table of somebody, there'll be a natural resistance saying like, why, like, why are you telling me what to, what to do? I know better than, than you. But it's a different story if those people are involved in the, in the process that, that you're doing and then together you uh, go through this uh, journey. So I think it's always important to have this in mind, both in terms of uh, some of the other colleagues, but also citizens uh, at, at the end of the day, or the politicians. It's always the same case, right? That's, that's, that's a way to, to build uh, ownership. Uh, that's our web page. That's my email address, so you can find more detailed information under this link, and uh, always happy to continue the conversation, so feel free to reach out to me. Many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Grigor. Uh, so, Henin, uh, please, you want to continue? So, um, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to um, speak about the possibility to use training and exercise as uh, a possibility to integrate strategic foresight thinking into um, policy making. Um, and that's a very nice vision um, of um, the causal impact that our work has, um, but it takes time to do that. Since it's a, um, a stranger strategic culture, I wouldn't expect this to come in a week. But uh, um, one thing that we, that we try to do, and I will tell um, uh, about the, the agency that I'm working in, is to spread the knowledge and the understanding among government officials um, that um, foresight is needed, useful, that it is um, uh, possible to have impulses and inspiration for planning, um, that it is fair to do so, that you can shape the future. All these things um, against, uh, uh, and we heard about that 
a certain resistance to accept these visionary, imaginative, um, kind of open ways of, of thinking about the future. Um, I will speak a bit about the Federal Academy for Security Policy, or much snappier called BAX in Germany, and the Center of Strategic Foresight. I will um, uh, elaborate a bit about the, the, the functions of the, um, the uses uh, of the strategic foresight in government that form an important backdrop um, for what we are actually teaching, um, and of course uh, also about the impediments, uh, and to uh, um, add to some, add some educational impulses that can come from uh, our trainings uh, in government foresight. Um, we are the Federal Academy for Security Policy. We are a central interdepartmental government training center. So that's, that's our core task. Um, we promote an understanding of comprehensive um, um, uh, interlinked um, security policy. Um, of course, we promote uh, German security policy goals to ministries who are not so aff afflicted with security. But um, we do this with um, um, a broad array of, of uh, um, seminars and, and uh, um, uh, events. We are an agency um, in, the, uh, in, in the area of the Ministry of Defense, and we have military on board. Um, so some other ministries are not crazy about um, like going into these um, like militarized settings. But we are actually um, reporting to um, the Federal Security Council, which is a cabinet um, a committee, um, consists of seven security-related ministries. And so we kind of see ourselves a bit as a, as a neutral player in between. And that is an important um, um, quality. Um, we can invite um, other uh, ministries, other agencies, and say, look, we, we are here for all of you, and not only for, for, for um, uh, the federal forces. Um, and we have a very close dialogue with the chancellery, who, who played a great role in actually establishing um, the Center for Strategic Foresight a couple of years ago. Um, the Federal Academy is teaching officials in um, many um, seminars of different, different rank. Um, we do expert and specialized conferences, and we try to um, give some impulses for the public discourse with publications. But we also have, since 2021, the Center for Strategic Foresight with only three posts, of which two are filled. So um, there is some, some room to, to, to grow for us. <coughs> But um, what we do is um, to um, uh, kind of formalize uh, the um, foresight work that is done within the Federal Academy. Um, what we as the Center for Strategic Foresight do is education, exchange, and execution. And that sounds much cooler in German because all the word starts with an A, and so we have a triple A. But it's clear that with education, I mean the, uh, the, the different, um, different seminars that we do um, and the, the, the build-up seminars, the... The, the tango silver course things uh, that, that we that we want to establish um, about methods especially, um, but we have of course also um, 450 alumni right now, uh, German government officials who have learned about foresight, and we try to to build networks among them and with the partners that we have and with the the people actually in charge with foresight. So um, there is a, a networking um, part of our work, and execution means we apply um, the, the methods that we teach, that we learned ourselves in projects, and we, um, we cannot take, take over the work that the ministries uh, should do themselves because we're too, too, too little, too, too small, but um, uh, we can do initial um, impulse uh, consultation when they come and say, well, look, we want to do a workshop on this and then foresight on that. We can help with partners and with ideas. Um, about our products, uh, and I would like to, to say a few words about the method seminar that we do, Seminar Strategische Vorausschau, Strategic Foresight. We do this twice a year, and it has three modules uh, per two days, so six days in spring and six days in autumn, we teach foresight to government officials. And um, what we want them to, to have is an experience and, and with working with the methods. So we, we're not only uh, lecturing them, but, but they engage in kind of test workshops about certain issues and try to develop scenarios. Um, we want them to know how to talk about foresight, how to spread the news about foresight in their own ministries, and to, to be able to actually 
um, write proposals for, for projects. Um, they want to have, they, sh they should have a market overview. I will talk about this a bit more. A clear understanding who does what in the government and outside government so, so that they have an idea who might actually be a good partner for projects. They should also know about the impediments and the problems that we heard about. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, it must be clear to them why it is necessary and, and useful to think about the future. Um, a regular um, format for that method seminar is that uh, I don't know how many of you are actually um, um, aware what foresight and what foresight methods is. So the people here, of course, and in the first row, but um, um, maybe that might help you a bit. Um, we, we hear a bit about the history of, uh, of, of foresight, uh, where it comes from. Um, the, the people in Rennes, the French uh, um, foresighters, others, the, the German um, uh, peace movement that led to foresight, foresight um, uh, methods. Um, we, of course, uh, engage in scenario development. We, we debate factors of certain developments. We rank them with uncertainty and, and, um, and, and impact. Um, we design scenario crosses, design scenarios together. Yeah? Um, we do storytelling. And then when we have a scenario, we, we move back and say, how do we get to the most desirable scenario and, and, and uh, avoid others? Roadmaps, backcasting, um, stress testing of existing strategies. So when we go on with that strategy, how will we fare if the future develops in this way? which is very helpful. We do um, um, Delphi expert rounds in a very small uh, exercise setting with a colleague of, of Feline, who is um, 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 Kerstin Kuhls, who is the, the, uh, the best expert on, on Delphi expert uh, questionings that we have. Um, and we do with um, actual futurists a bit of uh, social constructivist thinking about how we, how we create the future. You talked about that. Um, we do future labs um, in a different setting where people can imagine and, and like build with Lego stones and, and, uh, and, and color pencils. We, we do all that and we fill it with keynotes with people who actually apply foresight in government and tell stories how they, how they created projects and, and, and how successful they were. So um, it, that seminar is always booked out. We could actually do four of them per year, no, no problem. And um, um, my feeling is that, that um, this will be um, um, a secure job for the, for the years to come. Um, for the network that we, that we build up, um, we um, uh, do um, a foresight for Rüstück, which is breakfast. Um, it's virtual, um, coming from um, the um, COVID times, um, with international experts. And uh, Diego was once, uh, once a guest there, so I was glad to see him here in person. Um, uh, and uh, we have a, um, a rather good turnout there. We do um, um, Inside Foresight is our little newsletter, very light, with uh, actually tips on science fiction and board games if necessary, um, to give a broad understanding where foresight is done. And of course, we um, um, on the executive side uh, or execution side, so to speak, um, we have created with our partners um, with the German Institute for International and Security Affairs um, um, a workshop series where we actually pick up um, uh, cross-ministry foresight questions. Um, following the chapters of the national security strategy, vigilance, resilience, sustainability, this is about connecting different political processes and transformations that might ha actually, in their um, causal links, have certain challenges, uh, risks, opportunities, um, that can um, best be identified with a strategic foresight. That will be twice a year with foresight officials. And I personally am only happy if this leads to some sort of work plan within the ministries to go on and, and build upon these questions in the future. Now, um, when we teach all that, which is um, like the, the, the broad variety, the plethora of methods, it's always important for me as well that um, the... Um, uh, the, the trainees also understand um, how they might place foresight within their own structures. And um, uh, it is important to understand um, the functional context. So how and when would you use foresight? You don't do this for fun, you know? Um, of course, everybody would think, if, if, I, if I build up a strat political strategy, a, a technology strategy, or a regional strategy, I would start with foresight. That would be a very good idea. And actually, my joke is when I go to a, a, a supermarket and I buy packed meat, there will be a stamp on it saying, uh, this is organic, this, uh, 
the, the animals have been happy, or the, 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 the vegetable is fine and, and all that. And I know that I can trust this stamp. And I want to have a stamp like that on every strategy, contains foresight. You know? Um, that would be an institu uh, institutionalization. Um, I'm not expecting that. But uh, especially the, the, this, this tedious work on strategies mostly leads to questions for foresight, but doesn't use it up front because it's so political and the strategies are watered down. But you can use foresight to, to form agendas, to find what um, um, a research ministry, for instance, they, they, they did this, um, where um, um, your focus should lie in the future, um, or what, what units you should, you should uh, build up in your ministry. You can use it to sharpen your instruments. Um, one ministry does development uh, in a crisis region and wants to know how will that go on if the crisis escalates. So it's, it's necessary to look at a worst case scenario as well. You can use uh, foresight to, to bridge divides. When you, when you have, for instance, a newly formed government uh, or ministry where um, units come together that didn't like each other in the first place, who, who saw themselves as different sides of a, of a political divide, and now they're mixed together in a ministry. So you can do um, a foresight exercise that is less, less politicized. It's, of course, political, but not politics. I think we, we heard that. Um, is, um, uh, will bring the opportunity to create a vision together which is much easier than to, um, um, to, to like work on tedious things like, like budgets or anything. Um, and it will help you look through complexity. As I said, the, the intertwined um, transformation agendas that um, in Germany are now like, leading the political discussion, um, how will they actually interact causally? How will they impact each, each other? And how can um, foresight be used to help here? So all these contexts are, are, are useful and, um, and legitimate for foresight. And you should consider as a, um, a newly learned foresight expert um, where you would actually apply these. Um, of course, we heard about difficulties in the, um, in, in, in the ministries. I don't want to elaborate on that a lot, um, um, but um, in Germany at least, the ministries are very independent, and they have their own right to do things, and which, which means it's very difficult to have cross-ministry cooperation. In Germany, that's even part of the constitution. Huh? And there's competition um, not, not only um, between the ministries, but also inside, between the agencies and the, between the, the divisions in the ministries. Uh, party divisions play a role. If this is a, a, a social democrat ministry or a green or a, or a liberal ministry, they, they will have, of course, that in mind as well in, in considering whether they should cooperate. And you will never get career points for collaboration. You know, you get career points when you do something for your, um, for your state secretary. Um, if if um, this person is, is suddenly aware that you are around and that helps you and not that, that you have actually did a lot on the, uh, on the side. Um, many ministries also have different understandings of what strategic foresight is, and we talked already about the fear of the public. All that are things that could be um, spoken of in the training sessions, to make them aware and um, to discuss how they can be overcome. Um, also, where you actually place um, the, the foresight unit that you have, or where you, where you, where you bring in the idea and, and how you develop that. Um, in very rare cases, there might be a minister um, who is a great supporter of foresight and, and asks his, his, his or her house to be um, looking into foresight methodology, but normally not. <laughs> um, normally it comes from, uh, from bottom up, so uh, the working level has, has done a seminar and would like to do something and doesn't know how to reach the, the, the top levels, very difficult. Sometimes you have a future island unit that isn't really connected to anyone. Um, and uh, does great foresight, but nobody listens. Um, and you have, of course, lateral impulses from the sides when you have um, like government um, um, roundtables on foresight, as in Germany. All that might play a role, and it's important to, to in, in, when you plan a foresight project in the beginning, where to place it. How, first of all, how to win over your bosses, how to, to uh, relate to their agenda and to the agenda of the house that they have set up to make it more credible. Um, what are, in that sense, um, educational impulses um, added to the methodological training? Um, I'll, be, I'll be finished in a minute. Um, of course, um, show the people that they are not alone. Uh, in Germany, it's quite easy to show what all the ministries are doing. 
and this is only a, um, these are only a few, but to show that the, how the interest in foresight has grown, um, help them understand the market. That would be a, a, a simple image of the German, German circles of foresight with the government in the center and the subordinate agencies around where actually most of the, of the foresight is done. Um, with the great research platforms and, and organizations that we have, like Fraunhofer, which is a, um, um, a landscape of institutes with, with great, great uh, capabilities, but we have, have more of those. Um, we have international organizations that won't do your work as a, as a government officials, but um, can deliver impulses, as we've heard. We have uh, an academic field, and we have, of course, um, um, numerous consultants, consultancies that might help. And finally, um, to plan the formats, you need to know whom to convince, how to embed your format when you, when you set up a project. Um, it's important to think of it as a process, to think of the input that you need, um, how to make an inclusive workshop, how you communicate that to the outside, how you monitor it. Um, how you get um, impulses from the networks that you are, so you can co compare notes with your partners in a, in a round table that you like, don't, don't do double work. Um, but the most important thing is how can you adapt to your conditions to shorten the formats, to uh, make outsource some of the, the, the tedious work on, um, on factors in, uh, in, in like polls and, and surveys and then, then do some computer work and then give impulses for a workshop that can be shorter, not to take away so much time. And of course your budget isn't so big as, uh, as well. And um, as I said in the beginning, to include um, strategic foresight in the toolbox of quantitative and, uh, and, and qualitative methods that both can inspire each other. Thank you.